So hi, uh, as Russell said, my name is Brian Proppet. I work in the open source program office um, at Red Hat. A little bit about myself. Um, I just celebrated 10 years at Red Hat this past weekend. Um, and I'm always pleased to share what we do uh, around open source at Red Hat. This is pretty much one of the main functions of the open source program office. Um, we help communities um, that you know build our software um, in the upstream. We help foster them and maintain them and keep them healthy. Um, and we also do a lot of, um, as my title says, outreach, because there are a lot of people in the world who really want to understand not only what open source is, but how they can actually apply it within their organization. Um, so we get questions in my office from customers, partners, and literally people on the street. Um, true story. Um, about how does Red Hat do open source? And as we've been having these conversations over the years, we have a dedicated team um, of people who their job is to do nothing but educate and train people about what open source is and how it can be applied in their organization. So that's a little bit um, of where we are. So the background around how this is how we perceive open source. And it's very much ingrained in, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's ingrained in the fabric of our culture uh, in our organization. Almost everything we do at Red Hat is a, done in a collaborative manner because we believe in the process of open source where anybody can, as you know, take, share, modify, and build something new and innovate. Um, and you can, and customers can always look at the code and see what we're giving them and use that to, you know, build better tooling on their end. Um, so the, the, the kind of the joke about Red Hat is we're not that exciting because at the end of the day, we are a platform company. Um, we, we build an operating system. And in the past, that operating system was a single unit. Um, and then it would be modified to run on different uh, architectures. So we had uh, a platform that would run um, on edge computing or the Internet of Things, if you have that nomenclature, um, all the way up to cloud computing and virtual and bare metal and everything else in between. In recent years, we've changed that. We're still a platform company, but now we have specialized uh, platform versions that run in automotive and in finance and in high performance computing like you'd see in the energy verticals. So we've, we've kind of diversified our portfolio a little bit. And, and this is not really going to be a talk about our products, but I just want to give you an idea of what Red Hat is and how we use open source in our day-to-day -day environment. <clears throat> so this is very rudimentary stuff, I'm sure, for anybody on this call. Um, you know, this is what open source is good for. Everybody can use it. Everybody can view it. Everybody can modify it and everybody can share it. These are, you know, around the four principles of open source. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that today because we're pretty much all familiar with that. So why do we choose open source development? Well, when we got started over 20 years ago, <clears throat> you know, there was a you know, there weren't any other real open source companies out there. There were a few commercial endeavors um, around Slackware and early Mandrake and, and of course, uh, Caldera, which became SCO, which is a whole other story, um, uh, and, and SUSE, of course. So there were some commercial efforts, but there, you know, when Red Hat got started, there weren't a lot um, out there. Um, that we're building uh, a company based on open source principles. Um, so these are some of the reasons why we have done open source. And these are also the reasons that we share um, with our customers and partners and, and um, anybody else about why open source development is useful and important. Um, 
collaboration is one of the biggest reasons why we like to do it. Um, and also um, innovation. So the story that I like to tell, and this is really not a corporate secret, but for those of you who might be familiar with our, our products, we have a, a, a product called OpenShift, which when it started about um, over 10 years ago, it was very much a prototype of a container management uh, technology. Um, and after we developed it, <laughs> <clears throat> we really didn't notice that it was getting a lot of adoption, but it was growing slowly. And then along came Docker and, and their container system. And then very soon after that came Kubernetes from Google, which was a container orchestration platform. And we realized very quickly that compared to the version of OpenShift that we started with, Kubernetes was amazing. This was you know, they were knocking it out of the park to use an American euphemism. You know, it was great. So we decided because it was better for our customers that we would change our open shift and the underlying architecture underneath to become essentially a new Kubernetes distribution. A lot of the features that we built in OpenShift would come across and that would be contributed to the or Kubernetes ecosystem, which they were. And now OpenShift has become one of the most popular um, versions of Kubernetes that are out there. And the reason I'm bringing this up, because I'm not really trying to advertise for OpenShift, is that part about innovation, because we did all that in less than one calendar year from start to finish. And I, I don't know of any other company like a proprietary software company that could have changed the fundamental underlying architecture of their product, one of their biggest products, um, so quickly if it had not been for open source. So that's something to keep in mind. We're very much living and breathing open source at Red Hat all the time. And this is actually leading up to a problem later that we're going to address. So we're, you know, we're not just, as I mentioned before, we're not just using uh, open source just for code. We do this in how we work. We're a very collaborative environment. A lot of people who come to Red Hat are often very surprised at the level of collaboration that we have in our company. I work in the open source program office, but I can reach out and talk to salespeople and other engineers <clears throat> across the company and across the world if I need to talk to them. We don't stand on ceremony. I don't have to go to their manager and say, hey, is it okay if I talk to this engineer or whomever? I just go and talk to them and they can come talk to me or anybody, any of my people. Um, it's a very, in that respect, it's a very flat organization. And this goes to the top. If I need to ask our CTO a question, um, I will ask him a question. I'm not going to stand on ceremony and, and vice versa. So the collaborative notion of how we do things extends out into how we work as well. And, and now we're kind of leading up to, so I've got to give you a lot of background here. And now we're getting to the part where we're starting to talk about how we, you know, started to interact with inner source, which is a story that is, uh, that I'm here to tell you today, because we decided a few years ago, hey, if we're doing all this around open source and we are effectively an open source organization, how can we transfer those principles over to other organizations? So we have all these open source communities like Fedora and CentOS and RDO and in the past Overt and Gluster. Um, these were all very successful open source projects. Um, and of course now uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes. We do that well in the communities. Can we do that around organizations? And this is part of our philosophy when we you know, go out and talk to other organizations. We're not just trying to tell them, okay, to do open source, First, 
set up a source code repository. Second, set up, um, you know, a, a, a continuous integration or continuous delivery platform. I mean, that's part of it, but we're talking high level. We're trying to change their culture. Um, and, and that's how we were sort of approaching it. Because open organizations, as, as we believe, have all of these things in common, transparency, inclusive, inclusivity, adaptability, collaboration, which I've talked about repeatedly uh, in this conversation, and of course, community. These are, the, these are the key elements of having an open organization because we're an open organization and we really do believe that other companies can benefit from this approach. So we, we at uh, the open source program office, specifically my team, are working to take those open principles and build open practices because now we have to put that into action. We have to say, hey, how do you actually make this work? And so here are some of the practices. These are certainly not an inclusive list, but we're talking things like Scrum and Agile development and DevOps and using Kanban and then <coughs> Intersource. And I apologize for the coughing. I'm just getting over a cold. Um, Intersource came up and we didn't bring it up. Um, actually, our customers did. They, they were coming to us quite often and saying, well, what do you hear about Intersource? And so now we get to the, the heart of our tale and talking about, okay, how did Red Hat approach Intersource at the beginning and how are we here now? Why am I here in an Intersource Commons community call actually talking about Intersource? Because I'll be honest with you, at the very beginning, we were not so excited about Intersource. So let's talk about that. In the beginning, this was our definition of inner source. And we felt that this was accurate and fair. And this may not align with what your definition of inner source is, and that's fine. I'm only bringing this in as a sort of a juxtaposition of how we view the use of inner source. And it was, <coughs> excuse me, essentially, we believed that it was the use of open source software development best practices and the establish of an open source like culture within organizations for the development of non open source and or proprietary software. And right away, there's something wrong with that because that was our initial perception. We actually did get this from Wikipedia. Um, and I think they've corrected it since then. Um, because we all know that inner source is not only to be used to build proprietary software. It can also be used to build open source software that is just not distributed outside of the organization. So right away, we were starting off on the wrong foot. And this is, and with that perception that we had, which was not accurate, um, this led to um, the source of our big problem with uh, InterSource. Because again, Intersource is practicing open source methods inside the organization firewall. But the problem that we had, let me back up a little bit. The problem that we had was that term proprietary. Because even though open source seemed like a good thing at Red Hat, we were very resistant to talking about it with our customers and partners because it could, as an option, be used to build proprietary software. And our whole mission, our whole reason for being is the success um, of open source and open source methodologies. So how could we a good conscience advocate something that we could also be used to build proprietary software? That, you know, that's that was a real ethical problem for us. And I'll be tr I'll be honest, I think some of it was a little bit of getting over ourselves. Because we realized as we were talking about this and having conversations that this was still very much an important movement within the technology sector and it could not, could not be ignored. So we started building 
more pragmatic and more fair um, discussion points around inner source. And this was one of them. <clears throat> we would say, hey, why should you use inner source? Again, we were never saying, hey, please don't use this to build proprietary software, but maybe use it to build open source software if you have a need to do it. And the first thing, of course, that we highlighted was the fact that if you use inner source practices, you are definitely going to see an, an acceleration of development and innovation inside your company firewall. That is, as I mentioned before, uh, one of our biggest uh, gains from using open source development at Red Hat. Um, you will also increase transparency and accountability. Uh, and also um, the third thing, and this gets to something I alluded to earlier, Red Hat, you will enhance employee engagement. And those last two things are kind of tied together in our minds because basically what you're seeing is tearing down of the traditional silos within, um, you know, uh, co corporate development. Um, one of our biggest partners and one of the biggest IT uh, companies out there right now, and I'm not going to name them my name, but they, they have active siloization and also active competitive practices between business units. So if there's an idea that two or more business units have, they will actually compete and see which one has the better concept and the better end result. Um, that works for them. Um, that, would, that was something that we would never actually ever attempt at Red Hat. We do have occasionally, because we're a large company and we're scattered all over the world, Occasionally, we will find one team is working on something and another team in another department and region or whatever is working on the same thing. At that point, it doesn't become a competition. At that point, it becomes, hey, I noticed you're working on the same thing too. How can we you know, work together? And as, as hokey as that sounds, that actually works. Um, and we, you know... We don't believe in reinventing the wheel. We believe in coming together and working on one wheel at a time and building something better through collaboration. Okay, so let's be honest. We were also telling people, hey, inner source isn't the best thing. Maybe there's something, um, <clears throat> you know, there's some problems with it. And again, I'm not attacking inner source now, but I'm giving you an idea of where we were coming from before we kind of came to the realization to bring us to where we are today. And for us, we were saying things like, hey, InterSource can provide you know, a great deal of technical debt because you're inside the company and you're not getting a lot of outside innovation and you are potentially reinventing wheels that might be already built out in you know, the rest of the world and not taking advantage of that uh, those uh, projects and that talent, um, you didn't really, you weren't going to be able to tap into the innovation that open source communities and the upstream provide. Um, and you might have limited innovation. These weren't wrong, but I think they were hit a little bit too hard because I don't think we were giving inner source a fair chance. And I will be brutally honest, I will say that I was amongst those people who were tried to keep InterSource at arm's length um, because it felt like to us, it wasn't necessarily the InterSource was wrong. It felt like, you know, that, okay, look, you're, you're pretty much all the way, <laughs> just almost there to open source. Why not take that last step and open your code and, you know, let the rest of the world see it and you benefit from what happens afterwards. So here we are, and we would go in and we would talk to our partners and anybody else who wanted to hear the, the good news of open source. And we would give very high level talks and we would talk about all of the benefits of open source. If inner source came up, 
we gave what we believe was a fair and balanced look at um, what intersource the pros and cons were. And we would have these wonderful productive conversations with customers and then nothing, nothing would happen um, because we, we found out very quickly that talking about high level strategies of around open source was good and informative, but when it came down to um, moving over to, you know, a company over to open source, it just wasn't working. And we also came to this realization that a lot of those, um, the problems that we were having were that it seemed to us that Intersource was giving people an excuse not to move to open source. And then we learned consistently that that was really not the case. And that's when we realized that we were being wrong. Okay. So there's two things going on. The first, the, so the first thing was we were not meeting customer needs. Um, we had lots of talk and very little do. We had a we have and still have an extensive library and curriculum around open source strategy. We would go to all these meetings and they would, it sounded like everything would be going well, except they didn't. And this happened often. We would never get, we would never get follow up about, Hey, can we work with you to build an open source program office or help you with upstream communities? This may or may not, you know, and we're not talking sales here. The open source program office wasn't selling anything. We always give our advice for free. Um, we've never wanted to be a revenue uh, team with them, Red Hat. We're not, not going to be. <clears throat> so that's what was happening, you know. And then we learned that part of the reason, when we did follow up discussions, here's why things were stalling. Um, there was opposition, okay, and, and, and it came in three forms. One was anytime we would have these discussions, usually it was with higher level managers and executives, and, and, um, and usually the legal team would have a representative there. And sometimes they weren't invited, um, <laughs> so they would just show up. They got wind that we were talking to Red Hat about using open source, and they got, you know, they got very concerned and came in and I, they would always raise questions around the intellectual property. Um, that was their number one concern. And I am not um, knocking lawyers in any way, shape or form. Their job is to mitigate risk. And to them, um, tampering with something that seems to be, you know, directly affecting their company's intellectual property is a big risk. And you have to kind of explain to them over time that, you know, their intellectual property is not necessarily going to be as hurt as they see, but they hear open and they hear code. And that's the first concern that they have. Um, the other obstacles were how do we take all this highfalutin strategy stuff that you brought into us and actually make that into um, some kind of open practice? And that really even went down to the, the engineer level. You know, the engineers on the line did not necessarily even know day-to-day -day open source best practices. Those of us who are familiar with open source don't see this as a hard thing. Look, put your code out into a repository, build some governance around that, you know, around your license <clears throat> and things will progress, you know, nicely. Well, no, that's not necessarily the case. Um, because we're all familiar with it, sure, that that seems like an easy proposition. It is not. Um, I've even had conversations with people inside of Red Hat recently where we have a lot of new people in the company and, you know, they didn't come from an open source company and they're learning about this. I had a conversation a couple of months ago with someone here who basically was like, Hey, how do I build 
a, a roadmap around this open source project. And I was like, the same way you would build a roadmap around a product. I mean, you just get together, figure out what you want to do as features, and then build the build the goals and head in that direction. And he said, no, there are other people from other companies in this community. How do I work with them to build the roadmap? And for me, it struck me because to me, this was a very simple solution, which is the same way you do it any, any other time you would do a roadmap. Um, but for him, he could not get around the fact that there were other companies with other agendas until I reminded him that even at Red Hat with their collaborative nature, not every one of your coworkers is going to have the same idea or agenda for building something. So it, it even inside your own company, it sort of works that way. That is just one example of some of the quote, simple things that weren't being picked up um, uh, by the people that we were talking to. We gave them a lot of great strategy, but we weren't giving them a lot of tactical and execution advice. So here's what happened. Waffles, waffles, everybody. Waffles saved the day. And this became the epiphany conversation um, that happens once in a while that makes you realize that you've been approaching a, a situation completely wrong and you have to fix it. So for those of us who have ever been to FOSDEM in Brussels, um, there's a neighborhood over by the Grand Place. Um, and, in, and this is typically before and during FOSDEM, this is where you will find most of the Red Hatters because we know that neighborhood very well. Um, there are a lot of great places to eat over there. There's a lot of things to see and do. And I'm not here. I'm not a part of the Brussels Tourism Board, but it's a nice neighborhood around the Grand Place. And I highly recommend it um, when you get to visit. And one of the nice things is this restaurant serves amazing breakfasts, and it's pretty much central to all of the hotels in the area. So Last year at FOSDEM, I was invited to uh, talk to Claire Dillon, uh, the former executive director of the Intersource Commons, and kind of work out what was Red Hat's problem with Intersource. And it was a very frank and honest discussion over waffles, because that's important. Um, and we had this uh, realization that each one of us could help the other because we were stuck delivering strategy and not getting a lot of uh, interest afterwards. And they had, because they were the inner source commons and they were focusing on best practices on how to do open source inside of an organization, they had a lot of tactical level uh, learning materials and curriculum and but not really a lot of strategy documents about why open source is even necessary. So we quickly came to the conclusion that we were in a position to help each other. And that's basically what we ended up doing. And that's where, where Red Hat came to be um, a supporting sponsor of the Intersource Commons, because we realized that we could still be a part of this and still help each other out we, we won't be involved in anything that has to do with proprietary software, but we don't need to be involved because <clears throat> Intersource Commons has a lot of great materials and best practices that they've learned over the years that we can use and help talk to our customers. And we have a lot of strategy um, and open source, you know, knowledge at the, you know, at the higher you know, 50,000 meter view um, that could help them. And we see this as a very uh, helpful and symbiotic relationship um, that we have now with the Intersource Commons. And as I have said here today and in a blog that I wrote about this topic a few months ago, we were wrong. We got it wrong. And that happens. And the best thing that you can do when you're wrong about something is just basically say, you know what? Admit to your mistake, say you were wrong, and then go on and move on and in a better way. 
that happens in companies, that happens in real life. It happens all the time. And it's just something that you have to do um, when you are when you realize that you made a mistake about something. So right now, when we have conversations with customers, we are talking more and more with them about Intersource. Um, we have a team of uh, very good field marketing and field sales uh, agents that are based in London. Um, they are using Intersource best practices now um, to work with financial companies in the in the UK, um, and that's a big part of how we're applying Intersource methodology. We're building a collection of tools and curriculum. Again, sharing materials back and forth with the Intersource Commons. And now we're giving everybody kind of a choice. We do still say, hey, look, if you're going to use Intersource, this is a great way to change your culture. This is, and, and because when you practice this day to day, people realize, oh, this isn't really going to harm my IP. This isn't going to change and kill my company. This is actually something that we can use and take advantage of. And eventually people will get to that point where it's like, you know what, we may as well open source this. Um, and so we really do believe now that Intersource is a great route to open source um, and, and open source collaboration and all the benefits that we have um, from that. So we tell people, hey, these are some reasons why you would want to use Intersource. And this completely flipped back on, you know, what we were saying before. So if you're working on something that is intellect, high value intellectual property, but you want to increase the level of uh, innovation and collaboration, then, you know, that's when you use Intersource. Um, again, we would love to see you move on to open source. But right now we're saying to customers and partners, Hey, this is one situation where you definitely should use Intersource. If you're working with sensitive data and, and, and possibly in a risk adverse industry, but really it should be sensitive data in any industry, then yeah, definitely start using Intersource. Get your teams working together. Get them focusing on how to use these practices and move forward and get that collaboration going within your company. Um, data is a separate conversation. We can talk about that later. Um, but for now, if you're using code that has sensitive data as a process in there, Intersource is the way to go. Um, if you want to work on gaining new innovation and trying out new ideas, um, <clears throat> whether you have a research and development department or an emerging technology team or what have you, Intersource is probably a good way to go because you can experiment with new different kinds of technology and, and innovate in a much faster way than you would do in a traditional, um, you know, proprietary and non-collaborative manner. So that's how we got here. That's how we got from Intersource to open source. It wasn't a perfect journey. It wasn't, you know, a smooth journey. Mistakes were made along the way. But I'm very pleased, and the Open Source Program Office is very pleased to be a part of this and help Intersource out. Um, and they are helping us as well. Um, and I think this is a good partnership moving forward. So with that, thank you very much.